So, Michael. Yes, sir. We help a lot of people buy homes. Mm -hmm. Very important part of home ownership is taking care of the thing once you got it. So, I think we have a we got a few things in mind of uh, some maintenance that you need to keep an eye on that might not be totally obvious. The first thing that I thought of, right. which I experienced firsthand with my first home, clean your gutters. <laughs> that is number one. Because yes. if you do not, and you have a basement, yeah. it may fill with water. Yeah. The leaves will cause the rain to overflow, and you will have a big problem. Yes, that is true if you have a house without a basement, too, because if you don't clean the gutters, water sits in the gutter, gets into the little soffit fascia area, runs back in the house, and then you have the little brown spot like about six to eight inches away from the wall, and you think, oh, my goodness, my roof must be leaking. No, your gutters are full. We're, we're selling a house right now that's under contract that has about six or seven of those little brown spots about eight inches from the wall. And it looks like the roof is terrible. But then you get up on the roof and it's fine. The gutters, terrible. Like they haven't been cleaned in years. I had the brown so, spots. Oh, yeah. I, I did not know. It's, <laughs> that's funny. Beginner mistake. Whoops. An, another brown spot in the ceiling issue is uh, something a lot of people just don't know. Like I, th I feel like everybody knows to clean out the gutters. They may not do it, but you know, it's like, oh, yeah, of course the gutters need to be cleaned out. One thing that people probably don't think about, the condensation line from the HVAC system. That gets clogged all the time, especially if your air handler is in the attic. So if that thing gets clogged, it's in the attic, you're going to get brown spots on the ceiling there too. I suspect, actually, funny timing for this conversation. I might have that issue right now as we speak in my own home. So this is the time of year when it shows up, like March, April, May. And, and really, June is probably the worst because that's when you really crank up the air conditioning. Like even today, you know, it's going to be 75 degrees. You're going to turn that air on a little bit. So that's the first signal. So that March 1st time frame, that's the first signal. Air, air turns on, it's full of lint and just things that clog it up. And immediately, yep, as soon as that um, air conditioner starts condensing and there is some water particles coming through, it's got nowhere to go. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to get brown spots today. The other time that it becomes a problem is when the air conditioner runs like incessantly for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. So it's 90 degrees. That first time it turns 90 degrees on June the 2nd. That's another day that you get a brown spot in the city. And you're like, oh, what's that from? The roof leaking? No, the HVAC. Good segue to uh, a second issue that I have experienced firsthand and mm -hmm. have right now as we speak. Is uh, was underneath the house and I was uh, swapping out the air filter which is when I discovered I might have that uh, condensation clog issue. Also discovered that uh, some of the blocks that are supporting uh, one of the beams, the half of them have apparently cracked and fallen off. So oh, that no. is something to fix probably right now. Yes, you should not be recording the podcast. You should be <laughs> under your house with a couple of jacks. Yes, um, exactly. So I guess yeah. the to kind of bring it back to our, our message here is that's something to keep in mind like look under the house every now and then because the stuff under there isn't forever yeah i was going to mention that when we got past the the gutters and things i i talk to people all the time when we list their house and we have an inspection done and then there's there are things in the crawl space that they didn't know about i'm like when's the last time you got in the crawl space Never. Never. <laughs> like tomorrow if i went it'd be the first time <laughs> that i've ever been in the crawl space so yeah. You should go under there a couple times a year just to look around, just to see what's happening under there. Um, so many things can be caught and fixed if you do that. Mm -hmm. Like your house probably hasn't settled to the point that there's a three-inch dip in the floor wherever this pillar is, right? Right. If you don't do anything about it a year from now, two years from now, you probably will have a four inch dip in your floor and you'll be like, where's that coming from? Mm -hmm. You know, so. And what might that turn into? Well, that's a lot more expensive of a fix because um, if, if the pillar doesn't get fixed and I'm not a contractor call a qualified contractor for this in my experience when what you're talking about happens where I've never seen them actually break and fall over what mo what happens most of the time is they they're just shifted and they're leaning and then they fall over completely they don't actually break so mm -hmm. so you might have a little something different going on but what I have seen when the pillar isn't leveled or isn't put on a footer and over time it leans and falls over then you get a dip in the floor. Well, when that dip in the floor happens, the trim will break. If it's got crown molding or whatever, that'll break. The, mm -hmm. the sheetrock in the wall starts cracking. Mm -hmm. The floor itself starts to deteriorate. Um, you've got uh, usually a broken floor joist will happen at that point because all of the weight is now on the joist and not on that 
pillar. So when you remove that pillar, the joist breaks, you know. Mm -hmm. And so once one of them breaks, it's almost like a chain reaction. So it'll keep causing more problems until you get to another pillar, right? So if it if it's four feet away, you got three broken floor joists before you get there. So right, yeah. yeah. And something else that I've heard a couple of times, and I don't know, um, I don't know how many people are actually doing this, but um, maybe yearly something like that, flushing the the water heater. To mm-hmm. make sure that there's no sediment in that kind of sitting at the bottom. Mm-hmm. Is that something that, you're, that you've dealt with? I've not dealt with it, but it makes perfect sense that you should do that. Mm-hmm. I, I have not seen any issues from that um, personally myself. Yeah. But those are the three that, that came to mind for me that mm-hmm. might not be obvious. You got yeah. anything else? Um, I'll go with uh, replacing boards on decks before they become a real problem. Most of the time when we... Um, go to list a house, like we'll see a rotten deck board or rotten um, staircase. You know, one of the boards will be rotten on the staircase and they're like, oh, it'll be fine. And, and yeah, we need to replace that. But they've been walking on a rotten board for months at this point and even happened at my house, not the one I live in now, the one before that I sold. We were getting it ready to put on the market and the back deck was old and like I knew that it needed work and so I'm literally like moving stuff out of the house and I go down the back deck and I broke one of the boards that was, I knew was going to have to be replaced. Well, luckily I didn't break anything other than the board, <laughs> but it's very possible that I could have like, you know, broken my ankle because I didn't replace that step that I knew was rotten. Like I knew I should have replaced it already. Yeah. You don't, you don't have to wait till it breaks to fix it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's just, it's easy to put that stuff off though. I think for a lot of people. Well, they, they literally stand by that statement of, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, yeah. It's going to break, like just because it isn't broke. That that statement doesn't really apply to deck boards. Maybe what, if it's about to break, you should probably fix it. There you go. Yeah. If you look at it and you know it's rotten, you should probably fix it. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think, too, is it's your house. You're there every day, and you just like see the same thing over and over. I think for some people, maybe it just becomes, oh, that's just, that's just it. That's just the house. Mm-hmm. I'm used to it. Or, mm-hmm. You know, that kind of mindset. Another thing is um, sloping away from the house. People often don't take into consideration um, landscape changes or whatever and and so I see water like coming in the crawl space and things like that Mm -hmm. just because they maybe sloped the the mulch the wrong way or they brought in some extra dirt for whatever reason and and didn't slope it properly and sloping it toward the house is always a terrible idea you should always slope your landscaping away from the house speaking of mulch around the house I've heard people say that you shouldn't have it up against the house because it often has termites in it you ever hear that? Well, I will say this. We got mulch at our house mm-hmm. last year, mm-hmm. and we bought rubber mulch for that very reason. Like, we did not want the insects around the house and whatever those are, termites or any other kind of bugs. My wife cannot stand bugs, and so we went with rubber mulch around the house. And it's like got like a 10, 12-year guarantee, something like that. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that's a it's expensive. Rubber mulch is expensive, so don't misunderstand that. But... It's not expensive if you only buy it once every 12 years and you buy mulch every year. Right. Yeah. yeah. So what about, we'll say like servicing the HVAC system. I'm curious how many people actually service that thing yearly as recommended. Hmm. I would take the over under at 10% and I would take the under. <laughs> Do you? Probably every two years. Like I've got a good relationship with an HVAC guy because we're constantly referring in business. And so every couple of years I'm like, Hey man, seasons are changing come juice this thing up and matter of fact i sent him that text last night i'm like hey need to get the system juiced up so yeah yeah you treat your rentals the same way um i guess it depends um most of our rentals turn over every two or three years so Mm -hmm. so in that instance we we treat them i've got one tenant that had been there for a decade i guess and so we never did anything to that one um proved to be a mistake because when they did move out after 10 years of nothing <laughs> happening over there, we spent a lot of money fixing that one. Yeah. Turns out things do happen in 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. But it's one of those things where I didn't want to disturb the tenant. The tenant was paying great. The tenant always said, Oh, nothing's wrong. Everything's great at the house. Yeah. Which if you're living there, yeah, it is great. But if you're the owner of the house, it's not great. Like there's a few things that, that pop up that are things that you have to fix. Mm-hmm. You know? Kind of goes back to what I said a minute ago. Some people just like, oh, this is just how the house is. It's fine. Mm-hmm. I, I'm used to this. Mm-hmm. 
think a lot of people fall into that. Yeah, water in the crawl space is something that is, if you're a tenant, it's not, not going to bother you, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no big deal. But if you're the owner, water in the crawl space will lead to... That means it's something entirely different. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah, no doubt. So septic tanks. I've heard people say, don't pump it unless you have to. Mm -hmm. And I've also heard, pump it every three years. Mm -hmm. Those are two very different answers. I can only speak from my experience. Contact a qualified inspector if you want to know about your particular house. But I will mm -hmm. say, I have had houses that haven't been pumped in 20 years. There is one particular house that I own that I've owned for 22 years at this point. Never had the septic tank pumped. Never had an issue with it. It's worked all the time, every time for the last 20 years. And prior to that, there's no evidence that it's ever been pumped. Works perfectly. It's a good system. It's good dirt, right? So it's all good. You think it comes down to that? Like the, it does. the, the soil is a big factor? A combination of the size of the tank, mm -hmm. the number of field lines, the, the feet of field lines put in, and ultimately good dirt. If you have good dirt, the water disseminates, it um, goes into the soil, and it's all good if the soil will absorb it. If you have bad dirt, it doesn't matter how great the septic system is. It doesn't matter how many feet of fill line you have. If it's bad dirt that doesn't absorb soil, if it's clay, that tank's going to fill up whenever you put 1,000 gallons of water in it. It's going to fill up, and then you're done. Right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yes, yeah, soil matters tremendously. Um, you know, a lot of people have sewer, so there is no septic system other than just the main line that comes out of the house and goes into the sewer. So really the only problems you can have there, there's two main problems you can have there. The sewer system itself is backed up. That's mm -hmm. a problem. Or you've got some kind of main line blockage that causes a backup in the house. Those are the only two problems you can have with sewer. Septic is a little different. There are several moving parts to that. Right. Yeah. And so how, how might someone who owns their home right now and they hear this and like, oh, I wonder if my soil is bad. <laughs> how might they answer that question? Well, if you have to pump your septic tank every three months, your soil is bad. <laughs> <laughs> but if, it, if it's truly bad, bad, there, there are, correct me if I'm wrong, there's not just septic system. There are tiers right. of, of quality depending on where this thing might be. Is that right? That is right. There are many ways to develop a septic system on your property mm -hmm. the traditional is septic tank field lines and uh, there's this infiltrator system mm -hmm. that everybody talks about that that's pretty much the standard at this point right then there are two or three other types of systems and you know if you have specific questions call chip brindle or you know one of those guys rookie martin i can't even remember rookie's company name but he saved him my phone as rookie. So I think his name's Dwayne Martin. But everybody that's been in this town for more than 20 years just knows him as rookie. And everybody's got a cell phone number. So <laughs> he's just uh, saved as rookie and everyone's phone. Yeah, there you go. Um, so anyway, it, contact them if you want specifics on it. But there are graduated scales of, oh, you need an unconventional system or you need this special type of system. And so, yeah, they can range from – seven thousand dollars for a conventional system to you know twenty five thousand is probably the highest i've heard quoted mm -hmm. um yeah there's pumps and other things that you can put in to force the water out into the to the dirt so it can be a little complicated we've got a uh, service the hvac we've got to uh, keep the septic uh maintained i don't know of anything else as far as big systems that that i can think of that might need to be uh, serviced on a regular basis. Am I forgetting something? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's always keep the roof clean. Like we talked about keeping the gutters cleaned out. Mm -hmm. But if, like, for example, one of my rentals has a, a very low sloped roof, and so leaves and pine needles kind of pile up in one little spot. Yes. And so if you don't keep that clean, then the water kind of runs into that and puddles up. And when water puddles up, if there's a screw on the metal roof that might not be tight as it needs to be, water mm -hmm. comes in. Ultimately, the, the worst enemy of home ownership is water, whether it's coming from the roof, whether it's coming from the ground, whether it's coming from the septic system. Water is the problem most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was going to mention the leaves on the roof again, my house, mm -hmm. surrounded by trees, very annoying. Uh, you got to clean that thing all the time, um, particularly where the two halves of the roof come together, form a little, you know, crack. Valley, yeah. yeah. 
pine needles and such get stuck in there. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, anytime I go up there to clean those off, there's, it's always so wet under there. And mm-hmm. like you said, water is the enemy. Do not want that. Let's wrap this thing up with, you know, we're in houses all the time, um, ranging from million dollar homes to mm-hmm. DIY flips. And mm-hmm. so we've, we've seen quite a bit in terms of remodel quality and that sort of thing. So what's something that stood out to you? Either it could be, oh my gosh, this is the worst repair I've ever seen, stay away, or wow, this is a brilliant way to solve this problem. A brilliant way to solve a couple problems, or two ways to solve a problem that I've seen that I really loved. An older house, probably built in the 70s, there's a fireplace that used to be a wood-burning fireplace, so you know it's got that little nook beside it where they kept the wood, you know, Mm -hmm. so they'd take the wood out of the little nook and stoke the fire, right? Well, most people today have switched those out to gas logs. And so the little nook beside it, there's not really a use for that anymore. So I saw um, one homeowner put a gate up over the little nook, and that was like the dog house for the, the uh, inside dog. Okay. So I tried to replicate that at my house, and I didn't do a very good job, <laughs> mainly because my dog wants to sleep in my bed, not in the nook. And so that was a problem for us. But Is this the same dog that can just open the door to the house? Yes, this is the same dog that literally hooks her paw inside the door pulls the knob down and opens the door and goes outside. I would imagine a dog like that would just rather have the master bedroom. (laughs) Yes. That dog does sleep in the master bedroom at the foot of my bed now. (laughs) Um, But yes, she, she also lets herself back in after she goes outside for a little while. She will, she will come to the garage door and push the handle down and literally I've watched her do it. She'll pull it with one paw and push it with the other paw and opens the door to come in. It's, the craziest thing. I should video it. We'll put it on the podcast at some point. You did not teach this. No, no. She figured it out on her own. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. I think she accidentally figured it out because she was locked out one day and I wasn't outside with her. And so mm-hmm. she just came to the garage door and was trying to scratch the door to get my attention. And she figured out that, oh, it opens. And so now that's what she does. And so if you look at my door now, there's a little paw print beside the the doorknob where her other paw is pushing on the door. Like it's worn the paint off of the, that spot. And so like you can see she hits it with her left paw, the door handle, and she pushes with the right paw and you can see the paw mark. Uh, It's perfect paw mark on the door. It's nuts. That is so funny. Yeah. Uh, Something that I have seen, and this is one that's always stuck with me. It was a a flip house. Um, Knew that going into it. Like, I knew it wasn't going to be awesome, but, you know, the pictures looked fine. And we get there, and every single wall of the house has paneling on it, which is fine, but the paneling is not supposed to do this. Oh, no. Be a wave. And, you know, you see it, like, on one wall a little, Mm -hmm. whatever, but it almost looked intentional to the point where when you walk in the rooms, it's like you're disoriented, like it's a Hmm. fun house or something like that. And, uh yeah, I just thought that that was hilarious. Somebody did that and looked at it and thought, "Yep, that's we'll put good. it up for sale. <laughs> that's oh fine." My gosh, yeah, that's terrible. One of the worst things I ever saw is not actually a DIY project, but I felt so terrible. It's another pet story, but I felt so terrible for this cat. So I'm showing a house, and and people ask me all the time. They're like, "So do you ever get tired of of selling houses? Like you've been doing this for a long time now. Like you ever just get bored with it?" And I tell them, I never get bored because I see something new every single time I go out. It's crazy. But mm-hmm. so I'm walking through this house, and they had just asked me, like, hey, you ever get tired? Of I'm like, no, we'll, we'll find something in here that I've never seen before. And so I walk by the back door, and there's a little, like, suction cup cat bed that's on the door. So halfway up the door, it's a glass door, so you can see outside. And so the cat bed is suction cupped. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. Like, yeah, I've never seen that before. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Right on the outside of the door is a birdhouse. <laughs> so literally the birdhouse is like right outside. So there are birds that are coming to this little birdhouse. The cat's on the inside of the house and right next to his bed, he has to watch birds all day, which is like terrible for yeah, a cat. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if that's uh, I mean, if that's doing what they thought it would do. I don't think he's happy about having to It's like, to watch oh, them. he gets to watch the birds. No, he wants to eat the birds and yeah. can't reach them. And so now he has to sit in agony and torture all day to watch these birds coming in and out of the house. That is it's misery. Terrible. Yeah, I'm like, that, that's got to be the worst thing I've ever seen. So, their heart was in the right place. I, uh, truly. I truly think they were trying to be nice to their cat. <laughs> and then... And in the end, they caused them to need therapy. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, sometimes you got to put yourself in the cat's shoes. <laughs> And uh, okay, so Mr. Tim Larkins, he's going to chime in on uh, some of the stuff that we have talked about. So Carl, using mm-hmm. his uh, phenomenal editing skills, mm-hmm. is going to drop uh, Tim in here to tell us about some funny things he's seen, some repairs that he thinks homeowners need to keep in mind. Hey folks, how you doing? Tim Larkins here with Precise Inspections. We've been inspecting for 16 years in the same issue or same problem seem to come up day in, day out it's going to be exterior water control. We all live inside of our houses. It's very easy to neglect these things because we just don't see them on a daily basis or we're not looking at them. But here's what happens. That mother nature, with all the rain we've been getting in last night, was a horrible storm dumping water on us. All that water gets on that roof, goes to the gutter system, comes out. If you don't have your gutters clean, the water's going to overflow. It's going to fall right next to the foundation. You can live on the best hill for water shed away from the house that you possibly can. But if the last six inches, four inches of ground at your foundation walls slope back to that house, all the rainwater that has been driven against that house is running down and it's getting trapped and it's getting into that block or that foundation. If you were gonna do any maintenance, especially coming into spring right now, the weather's getting better, you can get out there, get up a, a ladder by the gutters or hire somebody to do it, is cleaning the gutters, cleaning the downspouts, and making sure the grading or the soil right against the house is the highest and it slopes away a one to two inch drop for the first four feet away from the foundation. So at four feet away, your soil at your foundation block wall should hopefully be eight inches higher than what you're standing. That should give you appropriate watershed to never have water getting into the crawl space and uh, or having water intrusion of your basement. Oh man, Tim has seen it all. I I can't wait to hear some of Tim's stories. Like, I, there's no doubt that's going to be entertaining. Exactly. So yeah, yeah. we'll uh, we'll we'll throw him in here, put his contact info up because if you want to avoid some of the stuff we've talked about, or if you want to yeah. keep your stuff maintained, he is the guy to talk to. Tim Larkins, Precise Home Inspections. There you go. Cool. Boom. We're done. All right.